Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an API point of view. Coming up tonight on Apex Express, a report back from grassroots organizers from last month's climate conference in Cancun, Mexico. An interview with Lee Miao Lovett, author of her debut novel, In the Lap of the Gods, and music and information from the Sushi Cal Band. We're your hosts, Karjit Singh, Ellen Choi, and Marie Che. Stay with us. Apex Express. Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Last month, environment ministers and climate change activists from around the world gathered in Cancun, Mexico, to continue efforts toward a global climate deal. Today, we're joined on the phone by Esther Wong, Sun Yang Yang, and Diana Wu, who attended the climate conference as part of a delegation of 55 grassroots organizers from the U.S. and Canada. The delegation was convened by the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, the Indigenous Environmental Network, and Youth for Climate Justice. Esther, Sonyang, and Diana will be reporting back on their experiences tonight. Esther Wong is the project director for CAB's Chinatown Tenants Unit in New York City, which organizes Chinese immigrant tenants to fight gentrification and displacement. CAB works to build grassroots community power across diverse, poor, and working class Asian immigrant and refugee communities in New York City. Diana Pei-Wu is Assistant Professor of Urban Community and Environment at Antioch University in Los Angeles. She writes and speaks regularly on issues of youth organizing, environmental justice, immigrant rights, and climate justice. She went to Cancun as part of the media support team for the Indigenous Environmental Network and Youth for Climate Justice and worked in the Women's Caucus with other sisters from Grassroots Global Justice and Environmental Justice Leadership Forum to develop a statement against offsets and the further commodification of life. And Sun Young Yang works for the Labor Community Strategy Center in Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us tonight. So I think Esther, we have Esther on the line, is that right? Yep, hi Ellen. Thanks for inviting me. Sure, no problem. And I think we're working through some technical issues to try to get Diana and Sunny on the line as well. But it's cool. We'll just start with you, Esther. Yep, no problem. Esther, can you begin by giving us some background on the conference itself? What were the goals of the negotiations this year? Well, I think, um, you know, the goals uh, were very different depending on, on who you represent. So I think for um, developed countries such as the U.S., Canada, um, the goals are really to push through, again, um, the, the uh, Copenhagen Agreement that was kind of uh, created behind the scenes at the last minute um, in Copenhagen at COP15, um, COP for the Conference of Parties, and it's the, the United Nations space where countries and NGOs come together to come to some sort of agreement to fight um, the global climate change problem. So I think grassroots communities like CAV, like uh, grassroots global justice, like IEN, the Indigenous Environmental Network, the goals are really different, right? And for us, 
I uh, feel the goals were really to um, push for the Cochabamba People's Agreement, um, which is an agreement that came out of um, an alternative conference uh, sponsored by Bolivia uh, and its president, Evo Morales. And the Cochabamba People's Agreement essentially calls for a drastic reduction in uh, carbon emissions, the end of the use of fossil fuels, and really things that are real solutions to the climate crisis. So those were the solutions that we were trying to lift up in Cancun. Um, those were the solutions that people talked about um, on the week-long caravan that I was privileged enough to be a part of the, the week before I arrived in Cancun. Esther, what was your role out there? You know, my role, um, the first, I was there for two weeks. Um, I felt like, for me, my role was really to learn as much as I can and to bring messages of um, international solidarity to to local struggles that are happening on the ground in Mexico. I think a lot of times, you know, people, um, especially abroad, don't really know what are the struggles of, of working class people, people of color, immigrants in the U.S. You know, that's not what they hear. That's not what they see um, in the news. You know, they really just know the U.S. as, you know, a lot of times the source of all of the, a lot of the, the issues and struggles that they face. So for me personally, I really wanted to bring the stories from New York City of immigrants and especially Asian immigrants who are fighting um, injustice in the U.S. And I also really wanted to, to learn and I think just really see uh, with my own eyes what, what's happening on the ground in Mexico. Yeah, and you mentioned this, but you had the awesome opportunity of participating in the caravans organized by La Via Campesina. Can you break it, break down for us what those were and what you think the significance of being a part of those caravans was? Sure. Um, first, I just, I mean, I want to say it was the most amazing experience of my life. I feel like talking about it doesn't act, can't actually communicate um, how eye-opening it was for me. And I really think it was pretty eye-opening for um, everyone else who, who was part of the international delegation. Um, so I was lucky enough to be part of a caravan that traveled through Mexico visiting communities that were facing environmental degradation, pollution, um, forced evictions, overdevelopment, and uh, it was all sponsored by the international peasant and small farmer organization, La Via Campesina, who um, pushes for Food sovereignty um, really lifts up the role of small farmers in fighting climate change and fights uh, agribusiness essentially all over the world. So they put together um, three different caravans with different routes traveling through Mexico, visiting different communities. And the one that I was on, some visited communities where local organizers, community residents were fighting uh, extreme river pollution um, one town we went to called El Salto. Um, there are about 400 multinational corporations who have factories in that area, and a lot of them just dump their waste in the local river. And this is a river where historically people have uh, used it for fishing. Um, people use it for recreation. It's really the source of a lot of um, the, the livelihood for a lot of people in the community. And what they shared with us was that um, the fish died and then the trees died and now people are dying just from the extreme levels of toxic pollution in the river that then kind of seeps into their groundwater, um, into the land, um, and is, you know, even killing children in their, in their community. Um, so that's just one of the, of the stories from the caravan, and I'm, I, I'm more than happy to share more. And once, so the buses actually arrived um, the beginning of the second week into Cancun, uh, where everybody else was converging for the negotiations. How did you bring your experience on the caravans into Cancun then? I think it, it gave all of us um, a deeper appreciation and a deeper sense of urgency um, around the, the negotiations that were actually happening in Cancun. Um, I think for all of us that were part of the caravan, if we had just gone straight to Cancun, I think that we wouldn't, you know, the experiences that we had on the caravan, I think made us feel all the more why we needed to be in Cancun, um, why we needed to be part of the negotiations, but also why we needed to be outside really engaging in direct action to put pressure 
um, to put pressure on the, the different uh, developed countries that were there who were trying to push through um, what we really felt were false solutions. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Esther. Um, if you could just stay on the line with us for one second. But right now we're going to take a quick musical break. And folks, we'll bring it right back after this. The song we'll be playing is called Life in Debt. It's a beautifully political piece by the Blue Scholars, who, if you don't already know, is a talented political hip hop duo from Seattle. Again, this is Life in Debt. Stay tuned. I like making you so You're listening to Apex Express. We've got Esther Wong and Diana Wu on the line. Hopefully we'll have Sun Young Yang on the line, too. Um, they're reporting back from their experiences at the Cancun Climate Conference. Diana, uh, many grassroots organizations felt that their voices were silenced and marginalized during the conference. You were part of a group of folks who was actually kicked out of the negotiations during the second week. Can you tell us how this happened? And how do you think the silencing of civil society impacts the negotiations process? Sure. Um, one of the things that was really interesting, so um, the, the Indigenous Environmental Network and the um, Global Alliance of uh, Waste Pickers, <clears throat> they held sort of what we call soft actions on the inside during the first week, which was just um, banners accompanied by speakers, songs, chants, and um, dances. And so they're very respectful kinds of actions. But um, <clears throat> what happened during the first week was we're sort of testing the um, the intention of how the UN was going to respond to those actions. Um, by the second week, when it became clear in the negotiations that, um, you know, the Bolivian government was telling civil society that, the, <clears throat> that the conveners of the conference were not actually debating policy, that they were having very general discussions, but not actually having the kinds of discussions where you're debating the text. Um, it became clear that probably they were going to run an end game um, where they were going to present some final version of text and without adequate time for debate and discussion, um, try and push it through, which is indeed what happened in the last couple of days. So in between, you know, civil society was um, very concerned by this development. And on Tuesday, when La Villa Campesina had rolled into Cancun, you know, thousands strong, and they had um, over 5,000 people in the streets, uh, the people on the inside of the conference who were sort of tracking negotiations <clears throat> said, well, actually, we need to go outside. The real solutions to climate change and climate justice are not being presented or debated at this conference, and we're going to go outside to join our brothers and sisters in the streets um, who both know the real scope of the problems and that the real solutions are coming from the grassroots every day. And so... The Indigenous Environmental Network, La Via Campesina, Friends of the Earth International, Youth for Climate Justice and Grassroots Global Justice um, folks, and also Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, um, we all attempted to bring our delegations en masse out um, from the the Moon Palace into the streets. And while we were doing that, um, Sun Yan Yang, who hopefully will be on later, Mary Rose Taruk, um, and Joaquin Sanchez really led um, chants trying to go get on the bus and get out of the conference, um, and the UN security did not like that. And so um, they both attempted to shut down the, the sort of coordinated walkout um, and also took away Joaquin's badges and um, Sun Yun's and Mary Rose's badges just for chanting and walking, right? These are these are things that we should be allowed to do in terms of freedom of speech and expression. Um, they're not disrespectful in any way. They certainly abide by the UN code of conduct. Um, I was filming and live streaming the protest as I had been doing for many of the activities on the inside that day. Um, I got flagged and um, some days I was able to get in subsequently, but uh, basically I was not supposed to be and not allowed in the conference if they caught me in there with my badge. Um, and that was really just for filming the, the protest. I wasn't really taking part as much as some of our other comrades were. Diana, in addition to filming the protests, what was your role out there? Um, the other role that I had really was working in the Women's Caucus. And so within the Women's Caucus, it's always taken a very strong line on the relationship between gender justice and um, the sort of solutions that are presented by our friends in Climate Justice Now and the Global Forest Coalition um, against offsets and also um, against 
initiatives like the RED, the Reducing Emissions on Deforestation and Forest Degradation. <clears throat> and so I was just doing that work with our other sisters from around the world, really saying um, from the point of view of indigenous women, of women from impacted communities, um, we're against offsets because we think you need to re reduce pollution at the source and pushing for real solutions to climate change. Um, and because of my inability to get in on the last day, some of that work was diluted by some of the other forces. Um, within the Women's Caucus, who are, who have been paid large sums of money by some of the international organizations to say that red is good for women. Diana, thank you for joining us, by the way. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Glad we were able to patch you in the excitement of live radio. <laughs> and um, I heard word that we have Sunny also on the line. Is that right? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Yay. No, no problem. We're glad to have you all. Um, so I have a question, and maybe Diana and Sun Young, you both can answer this. Um, just was interesting that we in Cancun, we were among thousands of different people uh, coming from a lot of, for a lot of different reasons, including the government delegates and the technical experts, the climate activists, La Via Campesina, which is the international uh, peasants movement, indigenous folks. From your experience, what do you think was the significance of having our delegation in Cancun as a contingent of grassroots organizers coming from the U.S. and Canada? Um, so why don't we start with Sunny? Well, I think it's, 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 it's very critical. Um, some of our, there was over the uh, delegates uh, from uh, coming from the United States and Canada, and some of our delegates um, were able to um, attend and actually be part of the the caravans that went from different uh, cities in Mexico and basically drove down visiting each sites of uh, struggles where uh, communities in Mexico that were fighting against the environmental degradation and pollution from corporations that came in through NAFTA and different fighting the construction of a super highway through the community. So um, some of our folks are... Um, were able to meet um, people who were pretty much fighting the, the you know similar struggles in Mexico through the caravan experience. At least we at the Bus Riders Union we have a very strong stance to like you know stop the expansion of highway construction because we know that 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 is one of the major ways that um, you know auto use and pollution gets increased in, inside the United States while tra public transit becomes um, becomes neglected in terms of Funding, and we saw a similar struggle happening in Mexico City, near Mexico City, in the community that right now, you know, is have been encamp encamping in, in the site for five months. And so us, a lot of U.S. grassroots folks who are directly involved in similar struggles in the United States were able to connect with um, communities in Mexico that were, you know, doing similar some, uh, similar fights against, you know, very environmentally degrading um, projects. And so um, I think it was really a good exposure for both communities to, to see each other and see that there's similar struggles happening and really build solidarity. Um, yeah. So we're actually um, coming to the end of our interview um, a little bit short on time. But I um, wanted to at least give you all some time to um, give us some last words if you had any and definitely shout out some contact information for people to maybe to follow up and get more information about your networks um, and the work that you do. Sunny, you, you want to go ahead, Sunny? Yeah. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So um, our delegation um, is part of the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, and um, it you can check out um, more information all from uh, around COP16 and what we did in Cancun on www.grassrootsclimatesolutions.net. You can also check out www.ggjalliance.org. Um, uh, yeah, those are the two main networks. <laughs> um, so Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, um, we know you know the EJ Leadership Forum, Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, Youth for Climate Justice are all organizations that we're posting both on grassrootsclimatesolutions.net and then also we were posting um, pretty regularly from the redroadcancun.com and that was the amazing portal that was set up by the Indigenous Environmental Network as well. Um, and so there's photo, video, live stream, 
um, and also blogging and other kinds of reporting on on that website. Beautiful, and thank you guys for being um, flexible with time. And sorry we couldn't get you on earlier, um, but appreciate you all being on on the air. And um, so, one other quick announcement is that the Bay Area will be holding a community report back on Cancun on January twentieth from six to eight p.m. The location is going to be announced soon, and that'll be announced on uh, West. Dot act for climate justice dot org. So thanks a lot for our guests. Now we're going to be taking a short musical break with some special guests we've got live in the studio. This is the Sushi Cow Band. <laughs> KPFA 94.1 FM, and you just heard a very special performance from the Sushi Cal Band live in the studio here in downtown Berkeley. We'll hear more from them in a little bit, but up next, we'll be hearing an interview with Lee Meow Lovett talking about her debut novel, In the Lap of the Gods, where a massive dam rises, a million lives are thrown into turmoil, and a widower saves an abandoned baby girl from the Yangtze. The book has received critical acclaim from renowned authors and critics like Maxine Han Kingston and Publishers Weekly. Stay tuned. This is Carl Jibundan Singh with Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. We're pleased to have in the studio with us today Lee Miao Lovett author of In the Lap of the Gods. Thanks for being here, Lee. Well, thank you for having me. This is your debut novel. It's met critical acclaim, um, which is quite impressive. Talk to us a little bit about the process of what interested you in becoming a novelist and writing a novel. Tell us a little bit about that process, please. My father's family came from northern China, and they were persecuted during the 40s when the communists were starting to take over more and more of China. By 1949, uh, his family had to flee for good because they had already fled from a small village in Shandong to a big city. At that point, they fled to uh, Taiwan on a boat with national soldiers, kind of making their last desperate retreat. And the region that I write about, the Three Gorges, is actually not part of my family's history. As I said, my father's from the north, my mom's from the south. Chongqing, which is the municipality created for, basically for the Three Gorges Dam, is, I think of it as kind of the, you know, in a way, the heartland of China. It's, it's off the axis that, you know, most tourists are taken to, the Beijing, Xi'an, Shanghai axis. It's still pretty remote, and so remote that um, during the 30s, when the nationalist government was steadily being defeated by the Japanese who were intent on taking control of all of China, Chiang Kai-shek dismantled the capital and moved it literally brick by brick, stone by stone to the city of Chongqing. Now, today, Chongqing is this sort of thriving metropolis, but the, the area's got this remoteness that creates a kind of mystique and I was drawn to some of the myths that I read about this area. I'm really curious about people who are on the fringe in my stories. And in this case in particular, I'm really curious about what happens when people are displaced from their ancestral land, from the place where they grew up, from a place that has deep roots for the family, for their current lives. And I think that's the connection between my father's past as a refugee and the lives of a million and a half people who have had to leave areas that have been rich, fertile farmland for the farmers, places that have provided livelihood for generations. Well, the Three Gorges Dam has really changed the landscape, both environmentally and also socially, socioeconomically as well. So for those of our listeners who aren't aware of what's been going on at the Three Gorges Dam, maybe you can give us a little bit of background. 
So the Three Gorges Dam was conceived during Mao's era, actually by Mao himself, as he sort of envisioned this incredible wall that would rise across the rivers of the Yangtze. And it took probably another four decades for that vision to get realized. So in the early 90s, construction of the Three Gorges Dam began, but it wasn't until around 2002 that the dam reservoir would start rising to where folks had to be moved in order to make way for this giant reservoir. Essentially, a river being turned into a still lake, in Ma Jun's words. And Ma Jun is a Chinese um, environmental leader who has really done a lot of research on water issues. So the Three Gorges Dam is, at this point, the world's largest dam. China is actually the world's biggest financier of dams. Hmm. And that's in dozens of countries, especially in Southeast Asia and in Africa. So the Three Gorges is really just one piece of the picture, but it connects to these issues that are going on really in a sense worldwide, that you have people, the indigenous people of a region, are having to uproot in order to make way for development. And the promise with hydroelectric power is that you have clean power. But it comes at the expense of people, it comes at the expense of the history and the cultural preservation of an area. There is an economic and environmental cost that we're not even beginning to be aware of. You know, these are the issues that I touch on in the book. Mm. Uh, you know, the book is focused on, on characters. Uh-huh. But what I do touch on is the c- corruption that goes on in order to get business done in China. And I also touch on some of the political conflicts and really the oppression of people who are disempowered by these top-down efforts, not just from the government, but also by big business that completely has um, local officials in their pockets. So it's kind of a David and Goliath story Uh in, in a way, because there's a parallel story in my book about farmers who rise up against the government when they have no other recourse. They can leave and then take their meager compensation, but they refuse to do that. And so that theme also of people standing up, of defiance, shows up thematically in the book in a number of ways. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the storyline of the book itself. So... In the Lap of the Gods opens with a widower who's scavenging along the uh, riverbank of the Yangtze. And this is on the eve of flooding as the uh, reservoir is being filled. The reservoir being the Three Gorges uh, Dam creating this new lake out of a flowing river. The waves lapped against the new shore, muffling the baby's cries. As the water advanced, it threatened to swallow the wicker basket resting on a spur of limestone. The river, now a growing lake, crept up the fields inch by inch. Now the ripening ears of wheat disappeared, their spikelets resisting the current before being pulled under. The baby in the basket squeezed her eyelids shut and cried. It was a plaintive cry like the sound of gulls circling above misty waters on a steel-gray day. The last inhabitants had cleared out several hours earlier. In the morning, there was a light rain, and the couple moved quickly. They loaded their furniture onto the boat, leaving the rickety beds behind. By early afternoon, the kitchen pots and pans, a handheld radio, pochai pills, and tiger balm had found their way into the nooks and crannies of the wooden vessel. The fog hovered in the valley, casting a ghostly pall on the outlines of the man, woman, and boat. When the river rose up to the mooring, the man released the little ark. His wife took one last glance at their unharvested vegetables, and they sailed away. But the baby remained. She was swaddled in a wool sweater, bundled twice over with a man's old cotton trousers. She lay in the basket, sleeping soundly, lulled by the sound of the waves swirling closer to the rocky outcropping. The wailing began when the baby slumber wore off. 
dusk was approaching and she was hungry. A cold mist descended on the land, smoothing away the peaks and terraced hills in a miasma of gray. Even the little nubs of broad bean shoots poking out from higher ground looked gray. But the creature was too young and too closely bound in her swaddling cloths to seek nourishment. The river rose steadily, crawling uphill at a centipede's pace. In the faltering light, it found the dirt path to the old house. Still, the swollen river advanced until the water leapt up and played against the cradle. The baby's cries turned shrill and inconsolable, like those of a wailing widow unable to summon the spirit of the recently departed. So my novel is focused on a few key characters, and Lou is a widower who has lost his wife and unborn child. And on the eve of the flooding of the Yangtze River, due to the Three Gorges Dam, he finds a baby girl who's been abandoned and decides to keep her. His nemesis, Fong, is this baby broker that he originally tried to take the little baby Rose to. And Fong's story actually develops in the book because he gets tired of dealing in babies and starts dealing in real estate. How much more profitable is that? <laughs> he eventually gets involved um, in the cause of these farmers who are actually trying to fight another dam development on a much smaller scale, but a much more violent outcome from from that and you can find out for yourself in in the novel but i do touch on political elements which would probably cause this book to be banned in china were i to publish it there oh really and yet i feel grateful that here in the u.s i can exercise you know my freedom as a writer as a fiction writer but also try to stay true to some of these themes that i'm seeing firsthand and also um you know, encountering through press reports about what's happening in China. Earlier you had mentioned that there was both environmental and economic fallout from this hydroelectric power. Even among um, the scientists and experts in China, you're going to find some concern around the um, ecological fallout of the dam. There's a connection between these terrible mudslides that Mm. have occurred in Sichuan recently that have to do with dams, not the Three Gorges in this particular case, but both the deforestation that's been occurring over, you know, many years mm. uh, and and also dam building uh, and erosion of, of soil. The dam itself was touted to really prevent these disastrous floods that occur periodically that seem to occur every hundred years or so. Mm. Well, one expert, and this was in um, Kaijing Magazine, which is actually a relatively progressive periodical out of China. One expert actually likened the effect of changing the water levels of the reservoir every year by 30 meters, that's what, about 100 feet, um, to the effects of a hundred year flood. What happened to the promise of this great dam? It, it does clear the uh, land in the vicinity of the dam where the farmers have to move and to less fertile farmland. So that land essentially has gotten flooded, but it doesn't address a lot of these deeper environmental issues. The pollution, just tons of industrial waste that get dumped in key m- municipal sites like Chongqing. And this stuff all gets carried down the river. And if you have a slack river that's not able to clean itself out, well, what happens to the surrounding landscape? And the Yangtze is enormous. The entire Yangtze is home to about a third of China's population. Those are big numbers. Wow. And... Um, a third of the country's GDP. Wow. So you have so much productivity and a lot of it's getting changed and converted in ways that are mind boggling because not only are people getting displaced for the dam, there's this huge government effort to move peasants to um, cities. Now there's already these efforts of peasants who can't sustain a life in the countryside to migrate to the cities, but this would be a government effort to get them resituated in places like Chongqing. 
And you're thinking, where's the sustainability in that? Where is China going to produce their grain or buy their grain overseas? And then the whole complex of energy and food and water. Well, so then where does the power, the energy for that come from? So it's very mind-boggling as you try to get your mind wrapped around all of this. Would the creation of a dam create mudslides? You talked a little bit about how there's deforestation that's going on. So are the mudslides just as a result of this continued deforestation, or are the dams actually causing some? Yeah, yeah. You know, the uh, destruction of trees, the cutting down of trees has a lot to do with the mudslides. But in terms of dam building, you see a lot of landslides that have been the result of you know a dam like the Three Gorges. And what you have with that is a situation where you've got less vegetation holding onto the soil. And so the dam changes the ecology of an area to to where there's a lot more siltation upstream and that collects behind the wall of the dam. But mm. then downstream, what you get is actually the loss of the sediments that are vital to the ecosystem. Mm. And when you have these areas that are very high and rocky, you've got people moving up the mountains. So that causes destabilization too, as land gets cleared for farming and for other purposes. So I think that is the connection. In the last days of Wuxian, the remaining residents shuffled about in a frenzy of activity. Men carried two by fours and wooden suitcases stacked up and tied to their shoulder poles. Women scudded along with overstuffed bags, dragging their young children behind them. Lou bumped into a grandmother carrying a baby in the deep wicker basket strapped to her back. She seemed to be the only person moving with a slow gait, and Lou noticed a pensive look in her eyes. When he asked her where they were relocating, she merely replied, "Far away." She blinked and then stared at him with her tired, sunken eyes. "I would rather die and be buried here, but this will be a town of ghosts." On the prescribed day, the residents of Old Wuxian climbed to vantage points all around the city to witness the final demolition. Lu found a spot on the hill leading up to New Wuxian. It was a hazy day, and only the sound of cicadas chirping broke the stillness. All eyes in New Wuxian were turned toward the abandoned city. Old Wuxian had a lawless, soulless element, and not many seemed sorry to let it go. In its last days, it was as good as the skeleton of a fish, stripped of its flesh and heart and gills, all of which had been scoured and picked clean despite the rot within. Just then, a few boys darted down the hill, sending up dust and scaring lizards into the brush. The youngest walked up to Lou. "Hey, Mister, what you doing?" Lou removed his cigarette and exhaled, waiting for the fireworks. Moments later, a great explosion rocked the hillside. The old city trembled, and then it began to tumble to the earth. Tall buildings tottered and fell like drunken men. Shells of low rises crumbled and turned to dust. The resounding roar flushed birds out of the cemetery's trees. Their raucous cries drowned in the din of dynamite that shook the entire valley. Smoke rose from the city in torpid black clouds as explosion after explosion went off. Old Wuxian had become a ship tossed at sea, and when the storm subsided, the city would sink into a remorseless, watery grave. The boys hooped and cheered as they watched the destruction. Lou puffed away on his cigarette, watching the rivulets of smoke trail out through the valley of dark clouds below. He had little to lose, but an empty feeling gnawed at his stomach. Although he had just eaten, he thought of the old woman's words. He thought of his wife Fei Fei and their home in Fengjie. And when he could no longer stand the emptiness, he got up and made his way back to New Wuxian. And that was Li Miao Lovett talking about her debut novel in the lap of the gods. You can look forward to hearing her at Book Passage at One Ferry Building in San Francisco on January 10th at 6 p.m. You can also find her at Magic on January 31st. January 31st, 381 Oxford Avenue in Palo Alto, at 7 p.m. For more information or to hear about the、uh, future upcoming speaking engagements, check out LiMiaoLoveIt.com. That's L-I-M-I-A-O-L-O-V-E-T-T dot com. 
And again, you're here with us at Apex Express. And we have some really good folks in the studio today, uh, tonight. It's a live band. They're known as the Sushi Cow Band. They're a three-piece band, and they're based here in the Bay Area. They're made up of Craig Matsuzaka, Zaki, now, now Matsuzawa, and Wesley Ueunten. And Wesley tonight is actually, um, who is also a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State. Tonight he's going to give us a little bit more uh, information on the band and also tell us about an upcoming event that they have. Hi, thanks for having us. Uh, so thanks for um, getting my last name right. It's Ue uh, Unten. Not too many people pronounce that. Um, and so we're known as the Sushi Cow Band. And we... Um, uh, the reason we got the name is we hang out at this restaurant called Sushi Cal right down the street here on Martin Luther King. And uh, so uh, we combine guitar music with taiko and the sanshing. It's an Okinawan instrument, uh, which originally comes from China. And it uh, came through Okinawa and went to Japan and became the shamisen. Uh, so we, uh, we play at all kinds of uh, venues uh, around the Bay Area. And um, I'd like to also um, uh, introduce this event uh, that we're part of. Um, I'm guest curating a, an exhibit on the Battle of Okinawa um, at the National Japanese American Historical Society. Uh, it starts on January 15th and goes to August 14th. Um, and the National Japanese American Historical Society, or we call it Ninjas, NJAHS, is on 1684 Post Street in uh, San Francisco's Japantown. Um, and uh, so, the, as you might know, uh, there was a battle. The Battle of Okinawa happened uh, from the end of March 1945 to uh, June, about June 23rd, 1945, and about a fourth or a third of Okinawa's population uh, was uh, uh, was killed. And basically, uh, most of the s- structures in Okinawa were wiped out. Uh, so this event, this exhibit is called Nuchi do Takara, Lessons from the Battle of Okinawa. Nuchi do Takara, uh, roughly trans- translated, it means life itself is our treasure. Um, so the, what we want to do in the exhibit is to... Um, show what happened in this battle of Okinawa, um, uh, the destruction and the um, senselessness of this battle. Um, And also, uh, at the same time, show how people survived and were resilient and uh, were able to uh, come back. Uh, The Okinawan people were able to come back after the battle. Uh, And then uh, another thing is, uh, people don't know, but because of the the large U.S. military base presence in Okinawa, uh, which began after the Battle of Okinawa. A lot of uh, Okinawan women married American servicemen and uh, came here to the U.S. A lot of them came to the Bay Area. So there are many survivors of this Battle of Okinawa. So one of the hopes is that this exhibit will um, allow or create a space where the women um, can talk about their experiences. Uh, so it, once again, the exhibit starts on January 15th. We have an opening reception January 15th, 2 to 4 p.m. That's at the uh, National Japanese American Historical Peace Gallery on 1684 Post Street. And we have a symposium on January 29th at the JCCCNC, Japanese Community and Cultural Center of Northern California, which is on 1840 Sutter Street. That's on January 29th from 3.30 to 5.30 uh, and we have a memorial service uh, commemorating the anniversary of the Battle of Okinawa on June 18th, 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, the uh, venue is to be announced. So we'd like to um, end with a, uh, an Okinawan song. Uh, but also I'd like to mention that the song that we played a little earlier is called Shima Uta. It was a pop uh, song. It was made popular by a Japanese band. And it talks about the Battle of Okinawa and then this wish for peace to go across uh, to other places, this message of peace with the, uh, uh, as a song, uh, Shimauta means island song. So we're, we're gonna play this, um, song, uh, Toshindoi. It's a upbeat song and it's a dancing song. So that, uh, at the end of Okinawan events, we have this song and people get up and do whatever they want.
tonight's show. Tune in next week to Apex Express at 7 o'clock right here on KPFA 94.1 FM. Check out our archived shows at kpfa.org. You can find more archived shows at our website apexexpress.org and you can also find us on Facebook. One uh, quick announcement before we close out the show tonight. Um, tickets are on sale now for Fred Korematsu Day celebration on January 30th. The event will feature Reverend Jesse Jackson and includes Karen Korematsu, daughter of Fred Korematsu, and Assembly Member Warren Fukutani. Furutani. Um, this is the first day celebrating an Asian American, and you can get more information at korematsuinstitute.org. Our outro music is produced by Asian Crisis. Actually, tonight we have some special outro music. The uh, Sushi Cowbound will be playing live in the studio for a little mi- the minute. Also, if you have any questions or topics for future shows on Apex, shoot us an email at apex at kpfa.org. Or you can call us at 510-848-6767, extension 464. With Carl Jigbundan Singh holding down the controls, we've been your hosts, Ellen Choi, Marie Che, and Carl Jigbundan Singh. Thanks for joining us tonight on Apex Express. Stay tuned for the Bonnie Simmons Show. Again, this is the Sushi Cow Band. Senso no